So we'll get started. First of all, I want to I want to welcome everybody, and thank everybody for for joining us on this Sunday. Uh, this is our first ever homecoming weekend. You can look forward to many more in years to come. Um, and while North Star and Blacks and GIS have newly begun to collaborate to bring um, important and exciting events like uh, the Homecoming Week and all of its activities together, um, we have not been doing this alone. We are not starting something brand new. We are just stepping in stride with the many, many uh, Black people, people of African descent, GISers who've been attending the Ezra UC for the past so many years. Um, who've always tried to organize activities and events and opportunities for, for Black people and GIS, for people of African descent to come together and connect across the globe. And so before we get started with our uh, discussions today, I want to share with all of you a quick message from, from Jack Benjamin. Um, as we CIO, wanted to make sure that he welcomed us all to this event. Um, so let's hear from him. Hi, my name is Jack Dangerman, and I want to welcome all of you here to this special SIG, special interest group of the Users Conference this year for the second time, Blacks and GIS. This very much reminds me of mm, 40 years ago when we had our very first conference. Uh, we had only a handful of people. Actually, the second one, just like your second one, had about uh, 17. Okay, you're much bigger than that, but it was small. It's still small. Now, looking back, when we're about to open the doors for uh, 60,000 people watching the Users Conference, you can see the enormous impact that that initial conference had. Now, the original conference had exactly the same purpose as you have and your special interest group has, which is to share what you're doing, learn from each other, uh, create a kind of network of friends uh, and, and understand how to go forward. There's so much to learn, isn't there? And uh, I look forward to you prospering. So in this sense, the SIG blocks in GIS is exactly like the oil and gas people or exactly like the forestry people or exactly like local government people. You're both the same, but also you have a special role, an extraordinary role. Many of you see what others can't, to use a, a phrase. Uh, you have experiences that are enriching uh, all of us in the march forward to make geography and GIS all around the world important. And that means inclusiveness. It means participation. And so I want to take a moment and thank you for setting this meeting up. I also want to acknowledge you for the amazing role that you're playing in formulating this group. And I only wish I could be around in 40 years to understand the impacts of what this is going to be, because I know from my heart and my soul that this is, this is going to be something very special. We are working hard with universities to get, especially black universities, to get programs started and more importantly, to get kids interested in our field. And you know, particularly you know from better than, than even me, but as an observer, you know what GIS can deliver. It can deliver opportunities. It can open doors. It can allow you to make those special contributions that, that, uh, that, that only you can do. So uh, I want to encourage you each to adopt a kid, <laughs> show them uh, the way. Showcase your own life. Share what you've been able to do and, uh, and teach them. So this particular role, I have also great expectations and will support you in various ways to make it happen. So thank you very much again for letting me in on the beginning of this magnificent event. Uh, I know Clinton and others have special programs planned, uh, so I, I wish I could participate myself personally. Uh, but I know it'll work out well. So thank you and good luck. So yeah, with that, with that spirit in mind, like 
the the homecoming is all about um, people of African descent, black people from all over the world coming together around our shared interests in GIS um, one time every year. And, and to get us started, um, to, to, to sort of set the stage for what this year's homecoming is all about, we pulled together a panel of speakers to, to speak to some of the, the topics within our main theme this year, our theme being COVID-19 and an equ equitable disaster response. So I wanna introduce you all to Erica Phillips, who's gonna moderate the discussion. Erica manages Ezra's relationships with federal health agencies, and she's agreed to help us to engage in an exciting discussion with quite a talented collection of speakers. I'll leave it to you, Erica. Okay, great. Thank you, Clinton. As Clinton mentioned, I manage Esri's relationships with the federal health agencies. So I work with HHS overall, um, but in particular with agencies like the Centers for Disease Control, the NIH, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, really the agencies that are on the front lines of addressing the public health crisis that we're all facing. Um, immediately before joining Esri, I spent two years living and working in West Africa in part during the Ebola outbreak. So I've got a particular interest in the intersection of place, health, and environment, especially as these impact our communities. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. We've got a great set of panelists who've agreed to take part of their Sunday afternoon and share it with us. First, let me thank each of you, Adrian Gardner, Dr. Clapperton Mavunga, Don Wright, and Linda Ojwada. Um, as I said, thank you very much. And I'm going to ask each of you in turn to take a minute to introduce yourselves and to um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you are engaged with GIS as it relates to disaster response as a bit of housekeeping. Um, please keep an eye on your mute button because when you speak, we wanna make sure we are hearing you. And for the audience, we are going to be asking you to put your questions in the Q&A chat box and we will get to as many of them as we can at the end of this half hour, at the end of this session. Um, I'm going to ask you, Adrian, to kick off and introduce yourself first with everything you've done over the course of your career. I think I could spend an hour asking you about the highlights, but please take a minute or two and tell us about your background and how you have worked with GIS in the field of disaster response. Outstanding. And uh, let, me, let me begin by saying uh, first, thank you to North Star and Blacks and GIS. Um, I just believe race, culture, and diversity have to become sort of an operational paradigm. That's one of the things that I pushed while I was at FEMA. And the other part of it is really making sure that people of color are at the table when decisions are made about communities of color. Let me say it again, make sure that people of color are at the mm. table when decisions are made regarding communities of color. So um, prior to uh, my, my uh, I, I just, I just call myself a recovering senior executive from the federal service. Um, and uh, so I had 30 years of, uh, of as a uh, career civil servant, uh, 12 years of that being in as a senior executive service member. Um, I, my last post in federal government was I was a CIO for FEMA. Um, I also did a, a year in Puerto Rico and uh, the Caribbean looking at how technology would actually uh, be used to create a smart island construct and bring more resiliency um, across the Caribbean versus isolated between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, I spent five years as the FEMA CIO, so a lot of the capabilities that FEMA has from a standpoint of technology, GIS, and the like that's used to, during deployments, uh, my team was, was responsible for, uh, um, to include uh, Ted Okada, who's the Chief Technology Officer and representatives from the Office of Response and Recovery. Prior to that, I was the NASA Goddard CIO, so did a, did a lot of um, work around um, really uh, satellite communications, um, sensing technology, um, looking at how uh, uh, what they call hindcasting, which is after the after the uh, the hurricane has made landfall, did we get the forecast correct, and how did the models actually compare to what actually happened? Um, prior to that, I was at Weather Service for three years, um, so did uh, leverage all of the. Um, was, was the point for all of the operational weather data nationwide, um, ran the telecommunications gateway, and also had some interface with the World Meteorological Organization, um, where we actually looked at how countries would share weather data um, to make more informed decisions. And then prior to that, I was spent 17 years at 
uh, Department of Energy in various roles to include cyber and IT and technology and GIS and a number of other, other aspects. My goodness. Uh, I, I now, <laughs> let me cut, I'm going to cut it off. I, I now, um, stood up a, uh, a nonprofit foundation called the Smart Tech Nexus Foundation, which is looking at how we use GIS, data analytics, AI, machine learning, broadband to empower underserved communities. Fantastic, thank you. And Linda Chuada, who's the Managing Director of Afro AI. Linda, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you too, and uh, thanks for um, African Women in GIS and uh, the not uh, the not the Star as well. Um, so I'm Linda Ochoada, I'm Managing Director of Afro AI, and Afro AI leverages uh, geospatial science and of course machine learning to look at problems that affect Africa. And uh, we are talking about uh, disasters as well. So um, looking at data, both from the geo perspective and analyzing it using machine learning and ded deducing insights on how to deal with uh, not only disaster disasters, but any other um, challenges that are affecting Africa. I'm young at the table, and so I'm really honored to be among your panelists. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Dr. Clapperton Mavunga, who is the Professor of Science, at, uh, Science Technology and Society at MIT. Dr. Mavunga? Can you unmute, please? All right, I am in. Uh, I prefer Chakaneta because Chakaneta is more meaningful. It means the one whose birth was very difficult. Okay, <laughs> thank you. By contrast, Clapperton is means absolutely nothing. It's the name of a colonizer who was in the you know 18th, 19th century West Africa. Thank uh, you. Nigeria. Uh, so, um, so I am an associate professor at MIT. Uh, been there since two thousand and eight. I went to PhD at Michigan, University of Michigan. Uh, born in Zimbabwe. My focus is on how Africans can revalue their ways of knowing and combine it with whatever else is out there in order to build resilience from the law. And my current work is focusing on how we can use our own indigenous sciences and technologies in order to uh, create climate resilience. Africans have been dealing with issues of climatic change for a very long time. And so, but now we are coming to a point where uh, we have all these tools that are out there and uh, including GIS. Part of my interest is how these tools can actually be impactful at the community level and be tools in the hands of communities themselves, not gurus like us. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, we have Esri's own chief scientist, Dr. Dawn Wright. Dawn, I'm so excited that you're here today for so many reasons, not only because you are a colleague at Esri, but um, climate change is so critical to this issue of disaster response. I look forward to hearing your comments as it relates to the intersection of those two. Yes, thank you, Erica. I am absolutely thrilled to be on such a distinguished panel here. I. I thank uh, North Star and Blacks and GIS for, for inviting me and Erica for moderating. I'm uh, very happy to meet the other panelists and I will now be following your work very, very closely. My role here at Esri as a chief scientist is to strengthen the scientific foundation for our software and services, but specifically in many scientific areas that actually cross cut with our disaster response program. So that certainly includes uh, climate science, uh, weather, hydrology, geology and geophysics, ecology, agricultural science, forestry, conservation biology, ocean science, what we now call sustainability science, uh, as well as geodesign and the many social sciences, including the health and human sciences. So that's an internal role that I have at Esri. And then externally, I serve as a representative of Esri to the scientific community, not in terms of sales and marketing as a vendor, but in terms of a, of a participant, a fellow participant in the scientific community. So to that end, I do a lot of work with the agencies that Adrian has already 
uh, enumerated in terms of his vast experience, all of the federal agencies with the National Science Foundation, with the National Academy of Sciences, with the European Science Foundation, with a lot of nonprofit organizations that have a heavy scientific focus, such as the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International. And uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting job. It's a job that I was asked to create from scratch when I came to Esri in 2011. So they told me, we don't know what a chief scientist is supposed to do, but you <laughs> create it and you go out and do it. <laughs> so Fantastic. It, has been, it has been really quite an adventure. And I came to Esri after 17 years as a professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University. And with regard to a disaster response, uh, equitable disaster response. Uh, I'm really glad that we have such strong representation in terms of needs and participation in the Caribbean uh, that Adrian mentioned and uh, in terms of Africa. My experience has been in the Western Pacific with the uh, Polynesian people. I've done, my field work has been in American Samoa, particularly in terms of, of helping with the mapping and the preparation for tsunamis and flooding. So, so that's the perspective that I hope to bring. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Linda, I'm going to start with you and ask you, what systems and structures do you think are hindering equitable disaster response? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? And I'm gonna open up to everybody, but I'd like to start with you, Linda. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, we see a lot of systems that are designed, um, that are generally there right now, that uh, act, are acting as forces against um, equitable disaster response. Um, from the culture that I come from, or from the people that I have lived with, uh, you see that there are these cultural beliefs that um, are really affecting decision making. Um, for example, in uh, West Africa, whenever there is a disaster, let's say volcanicity, they believe that the gods are, hung, are, are very angry with them. So there's this big disaster with it. Or some people believe in black magic. I mean, this is from the background that I come from. But at the same time, when you look at the Western world, you see that um, we have uh, things uh, like um, beliefs that this climate change is a hoax. So people do not at all uh, design responses according to this, uh, according to uh, uh, whatever uh, disaster that is affecting. So they believe in something and therefore uh, these, belief make, these beliefs makes, makes it so hard for equitable disaster response. Or, um, we look at the society and the decision makers. Uh, most decision makers have biases. Whenever you uh, bring, uh, bring uh, on the table a specific, um, a specific problem in, 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 in disaster, the people at the table will first of all look at what is affecting them before looking at what is affecting the other people at, at, at all. Um, and uh, another hindrance is the privileged selectivity in treatment and especially uh, look at what is happening right now, the COVID-19. You have this privileged selectivity instead of people looking at triage during, uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, treatment. So you are there as a nurse, as a doctor, and there are two people coming. There is a person of color, and of course you have a white person, and you, they have the same problem. Who will you choose among the two people? And there's only a possibility of you treating one. So there is this kind of uh, privileged selectivity that is acting against uh, responses, responses to, dis to disaster. Um, uh, one more, uh, one more thing there is uh, about uh, about uh, about uh, um, uh, hin about this uh, hindrance is a hidden power structure. There is a case here in uh, German where um, a company right now allows workers to work with no regulations to uh, to safety. But then, when you look at it, because a person, uh, this, the owner of this company, donated to a ruling party then people are allowed to work. 
So there is this, there is this hidden structure that is not followed within power that is really affecting and hence a very a, a hindrance to equitable disaster response. So if I could recap quickly, it sounds like you're saying that there's implicit bias, that there are political structures, social structures that are hindering equitable disaster response. Um, I just want to say also, you should know that it's not just where you come from that people think climate change is a hoax. And we, have, <laughs> we are experiencing that here as well. On a related issue, um, Adrian and Dawn, can I ask you, what would equitable disaster response look like to you? Let me start with you, Adrian. So, so let me just, uh, you know, footstop what Linda was saying, because one of the things I've, I have spoken to uh, Craig Fugate, who was a former mm -hmm. FEMA administrator uh, under the Obama administration. And one of the concepts he's pushing is this whole thing of a resiliency divide, right? Mm -hmm. that, that actually, as we look at communities, that we look at cultures, as we look at people, again, there are different drivers that drive then the ability for those communities to withstand um, sort of uh, shocks, um, whether they be natural shocks, financial shocks, economic, so on and so forth, right? So one of the things that we have to think about when we, when we start envisioning what that looks like is really now, um, and that's what some of my foundation is doing, is really going down and speaking at the community level and pushing these themes of resiliency um, so as we rebuild after the disaster, the real question is what was done to improve the resiliency of the community the next time it happens? In a lot of cases, the answer is nothing because there's no strategic view on how do I bring that, how do I increase sustainability? How do I create resiliency in communications? Those kinds of things. Those, those kinds of investments often take years and they have to go through some political infrastructure and political structures. So even if you look at Katrina today, or if you look at Puerto Rico today, right? The real question is how resilient is Puerto Rico today in the aftermath of Maria years later? And the same could be said for Katrina, right? Katrina is a little bit different where now they've put in place some barriers, but now the water has just moved and impacted other communities. So then your question is how was flood planning a part of the discussion as they put in these different resiliency or contingency measures, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think we have to think about is how do we really get in on the front end of that and really talk about preparedness and planning with those communities at the local level and then communicate that up because in sort of a master planning way um, up to the higher ups that have responsibility politically and, and geographically for those areas. Fantastic. Thank you. Dawn, do you want to speak on this? Yeah, it would be very hard to improve on what Adrian has just shared. Uh, I'll, I'll just add uh, my agreement with, with that greatly. And I've just come across a document, uh, Principles of Equitable and Effective Disaster Response, that was put together by a distributed team of community organizers that are highlighting uh, some of the ideas and principles that Adrian has already shared. And one of the the big uh, pieces of emphasis there is to realign uh, responses to the disaster around community-centric leadership. And so that's another, uh, that's a part of this, uh, the, the principle of, of resiliency and to foster some type of culture because a lot of this is culture change, especially when we're trying to move from the local level to the state level to the national level uh, because of the the power structures that Linda has already touched on that are uh, rampant throughout Europe and Africa, uh, everywhere, there is not a spirit of asking and listening uh, to the people who are directly experiencing the crisis. There is not an equitable distribution of power in terms of distributing information and resources, decision-making ability, and in Samoa, I've experienced this in terms of the power distribution has now gone to the local chiefs, the local tribes and councils. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are no uh, protected areas or coastal management regions now in American Samoa that exist without their input, which is something that uh, we, I, I wish we could hear more about and that could be adopted in other places. Another principle is to collaborate uh, strategically to work with institutions so that everybody is thinking upfront about equity and justice as a goal 
seeking appropriate solutions. So we have to have uh, people with varied skills uh, for every unique situation and then using appropriate technology. And so this hits at the heart of why we are all here for, for this conference. The idea that tools, given the complexity and the beauty of GIS and all of the uh, complex spatial anal uh, analytics that's behind GIS, how can we still make tools that are simple, accessible, freely available, well documented, so that everybody is able to, to participate uh, on the technology side? Right. Thank you. So actually, those comments about community and society give me a great uh, place to ask Dr. Mubunga to speak. And understanding that there are some things that community groups can't control, what are some of the things that we can do to proactively prepare for the next disaster? Dr. Mubunga? You need to unmute, please. Uh, so, speaking as an African, I have over the years diagnosed that uh, uh, Africa suffers a problem of uh, having um, thinkers who are not doers. Mm. Sometimes we may uh, call them critical thinkers, but even that threshold may be too high. And then, then on the other hand, you have uh, doers who are not uh, critical thinkers. So, and, and whereas what we really need is uh, people who are critical thinker doers. This is why I style myself as a critical thinker doer. That's the first challenge to um, resilience. Those of us who are in positions to know this stuff, it remains an elite practice, which only us can do. It doesn't pickle it to the ground where it's most needed. Mm. The second problem is that you know, follows from that. Every time you hear most of what, about what is wrong in Africa, even in our communities here in the United States, what is wrong? Uh, very few people are talking from the experience of actually saying what could be done right mm -hmm. from the trenches. So, and the problem is often that once we have, we have a, a kind of amnesia, once we have succeeded, we are these top institutions, we never go back. We never at all, we are done, we are finished. Whereas we could actually be catalysts in our own communities for what's good. Uh, the link chain between the community and those connections that we have. The third thing that I find is that our knowledge structures and the definition of resilience is a very top down one comes out of an assumption that people don't know. They have problems and we acknowledge them as having problems, They've, thereby disempowering them. Mm. We don't realize that they know a lot, what I call everyday innovation or creative resilience, where even when their backs are against the wall, people don't just roll over and die. Um, they die fighting or fight in order to stay alive. You can look at the at all battle zones in the world. You can look at the most distressing uh, places, be it Katrina, the south side of Chicago, Brockton, Massachusetts. All these places, there are people there that are fighting. And what they are looking out for are people who can acknowledge their agency and come to meet them halfway with what they know, what they know to be empowering, so that something stronger resilient can be built. So as we speak, just to finish, as we speak, uh, about 25 minutes ago, I just received a text message from my counselor um, who is so excited to be leading an entire community of 12,000 in Western, in, in Marondera, uh, Zimbabwe, building wire dams to because there's a serious drought. Two years now, it's not been raining well. And all this water was just flowing all the way to the sea. And now they, from a pilot project we did last year, physical, we were able to have a proof of concept for where them. Now we are multiplying those to between six to 10 this year. 
I use my contacts here to raise funds. Those on the ground, mothers, um, men, uh, children, they are busy as we speak with everything they have to contribute their part, labor, uh, non-industrial materials, in order to meet us halfway, those of us who can send cement to build these structures. And how good it would be that if GIS could come in with historians teaming together to identify spots that used to have springs uh, so that we can figure out how it is that it, we deteriorated to a point where not a single spring remains where in the 1940s, due to indigenous knowledge of people, everyday knowledge of people, those springs were there because it was taboo to take uh, pots filled with soot or carbon and any other contaminating material to a spring. And so those springs survived. By contrast, when picture now, not a single spring survives. My point is this, that there has to come a point when those who are in the academy must come down to the everyday life level to combine with people and see them as people who know. Right. And magic will happen. Thank you. Okay, we are coming into the final minutes. I, I'm so sorry we're not going to get to all of the questions, but I, there's one I have to ask because it's 2020. As we see COVID-19 death tolls rising, um, I'm going to start with you, Adrian, but I'm going to ask each of you to take just a minute to talk about this. Why are communities of color particularly vulnerable? And I'm going to add one more spin onto this. I am anxious about the intersection of disaster and COVID-19 when resources are already um, in short supply. What is this going to mean for our communities? Adrian, can you kick us off, please? Yeah, very quickly. I mean, I think the number one issue that I see is one that we already had existing health disparities in those, in those communities of color. The second thing is then, I think, fragmented and inconsistent risk communication from top to bottom and from left to right, east to west, however you want to say it. We are not communicating risk in a, in a way in which people can consume it and take action to protect themselves. Okay. One of the things that I did, you know, initially when this happened was went to the, you know, the, the World Health Organization website, went to, you know, what was happening in England from the standpoint of uh, guidance that they were putting out. And what I, I could quickly discern dis that the guidance they were putting out was vastly different than what the U.S. was transmitting and communicating. So I, th I think risk communication is the number one thing for me. Okay, thank you. Linda? Um, I will support um, Adrian with the risk communication. Um, just uh, recently, um, you had a problem in the street where someone uh, really has COVID-19, dies on the street, yet you have people coming and witnessing the process. And I find these as a lack of enforcing laws and, and not really uh, communicating what COVID-19 really means to people and to see that it's really happening. So I imagine that some of our community also imagine is a hoax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Don. This is a really tough one because, uh, and, and certainly uh, what Adrian and Linda have shared, I completely agree with. And in 2020, we have a perfect storm of four factors because there is uh, the COVID-19 public health crisis and how it disproportionately affects communities of color that is interwoven with the economic crisis because of the, uh, the, the shutdown, the lockdowns. And so uh, communities that were suffering are suffering even more, or the so-called essential workers are the people of color putting themselves even more at risk of contracting COVID, but it's intertwined with the economy. There is this awakening now uh, about uh, racism and uh, white power structures, white supremacy in the US and in uh, Europe. I believe there's always been that uh, awakening in Africa 
uh, it, it's been lived every single day, but now it's a reckoning. We, we're going now from an awakening to a reckoning, and there are our, our allies who want to do something uh, about it. But the flip side of that is that they want a silver bullet. Uh, yes. They want, especially those of us who are people of color, to tell them or to do for them to fix it for for all of us. And even technologically, that is impossible to do. They must take ownership. Uh, we all must take ownership. And then overarching all of that is an ongoing climate crisis. Uh, we, we still have, uh, we talk about people getting their temperatures taken uh, because of COVID-19. The planet is running a high, a high fever. And because of that, now we, we have the continuing strange uh, weather and long-term climate patterns. Uh, we right. have the superstorms and all of that. So how do we create technological solutions uh, that actually touch on all four of those simultaneously? Thank you so much. And in the final 30 seconds, forgive me for limiting you to that. Um, Dr. Mavunga, can you give us the final word on that issue, please? What do we do when governments ultimately fail? Or should I say fail us? The structures that we have in place are top down. Uh, we rely on government too much. Okay, we can say we have in the United States, we have the uh, federal government, if it fails, we go to the governors. But what if both don't quite succeed, as some governors are not succeeding? This is why the best option, the best leg forward is to build sustainability and resilience capacity in our own communities. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are, thank you, each of the panelists. Thank you, North Star and Blacks and GIS. This has been a great discussion. I wish we had more time for it. Um, we are now going to continue with a short video on uh, innovators in GIS. Please, can we have the video? I'm sorry, I didn't ask you all to please take the poll. The poll should have uh, popped up in your window. Please take the poll. Thank you. Okay, we're allowing two minutes to complete the poll. Are we getting poll results? Yes, Erica. In the meantime, um, there's a question that came in, and I actually want to take this opportunity to ask the panelists. Um, and it is, do you think this discussion about race, equity, equity, and an equitable disaster response belongs on big stages like at the Ezra UC? I would love to answer that as an Esri director. <laughs> if, if I may quickly, I think absolutely it must be on on the stage, and if I could be a bit controversial here uh, among our, our uh, community, we are, and as you heard from, from Jack Dangerman, uh, we are welcomed. This is a very powerful message now that we are bringing to, uh, not only to the GIS com community, but to Esri as a company. Esri runs the user conference. Esri puts on the big stage. Esri is now going through an awakening and a reckoning, and it's going to, to take some time. Uh, diversity is also not the same as equality. So we, we are seeking a diversity in our program and in who we have on the plenary stage, but we are not there yet. So uh, we have to, to keep pushing. This is Adrian. Let me just foot stomp what John said. And I, and I would say not only for the Esri UC, but at, and in boardrooms across the country, across the world, this must be a discussion, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I, we had need to take the protests from the street into the boardroom. So with black leaders who are in those boardrooms must speak up and represent the communities from which they come. If they don't, then we're going to end up in the same place and no change will be made. Again, they'll try to limit it to a singular conversation. If you look at Black Lives Matter, it's really now gone towards policing. It's bigger than that. It's, there's economic equity. There's a whole different facets to this discussion. 
So we have got to stand up and have those discussions um, a, long, like, a lot like the military is doing now. We see a lot of those general officers taking a stand. You know, it's clear that there's a lot more that we could talk about. So I'm inviting everybody to participate in the networking events that uh, are part of this homecoming so that we can continue to engage each other, please. So can we move forward with the video now? You know, do we have a video? Okay. My name is Sihana Lina Williams, and I am the GIS Mapping Specialist for Vault in Ghana Limited, which is a subsidiary of Coca-Cola Beverages Africa. I am also the co-founder of African Women in GIS, alongside Chidima Omiyuku from Nigeria. African Women in GIS was officially created in October 2019, where I met Chidima Omiyuku on LinkedIn. There we were discussing various reasons why I would like to create a platform for African women in the geospatial industry. We realized that the number one issue was that fellow women did not know who to go to to get advice in terms of favoring their career in the geospatial industry. We also realized that there was a low level of awareness of the geospatial industry. Therefore, less people and in turn, less number of women found themselves in those fields. We then came out with the notion that we would like to create a platform that will help to promote African women in GIS. In turn, we could use this platform to further educate Africa in the benefits of the geospatial industry and the geospatial technologies. Now, African women in GIS can proudly say that we have about 170 plus members with 3,000 followers on LinkedIn and about 300 followers on Twitter. Our community aims to create a platform where African women can feel very comfortable among people like them. They can share advice, they can network, they can create more friends in the geospatial industry. They can also get access to job opportunities and courses that they may be interested in. We have also organized and we have collaborated with other organizations to help our members take part in projects that can help to increase their credibility and also help them to get more projects on their portfolio. We aim in the future to reach out to schools and to teach students the importance and to create awareness of the geospatial industry. This will help increase the number of people in the geospatial industry, will help create more job opportunities for people in the geospatial industry, especially women, and will help create more opportunities for our children in the near future. This is to help bridge the gap of not only the awareness of geospatial industry in Africa, but to also bridge the gap of the women in the geospatial industry in Africa. Our community is especially excited to take part in the upcoming EDUC event. We are even more excited because we have been invited by our homecoming organizers, North Star, to take part in the homecoming event sessions. We are very happy to see people like us taking up such high mantles and taking up very key presentations to let us know that people like us can actually take up such mantles. It is a motivation to people like me. We are very excited to have two of our members take part in the sessions, Linda Otwada and our co-founder, Chidema Omegu. I will also be personally taking up the session to talk about African women in GIS in the upcoming Every UC event. I thank you very much, Every, for inviting our community and I thank you very much, Monsta, for involving our community in the homecoming event. Thank you. My name is Shamika Pickett, and I am the founder and principal consultant of Alfred D. Witt Art. Alfred D. Witt Art is a social impact consultancy that works with a cross-section of people and organizations to advance racial equity in communities, enterprises, and systems. 
It is well documented that disasters have a disproportionate impact on black, indigenous, and people of color, people with low incomes, and people with mental and physical disabilities. These communities suffer the most loss and receive the least emergency support during and in the aftermath of disasters. Businesses can support emergency preparedness and response along racial and socioeconomic lines at the local, regional, and national levels. Sometimes, however, a lack of clarity of the role race and socioeconomics play in disaster preparedness or response can cause businesses and people to hesitate to contribute solutions or a lack of clarity can cause people and businesses to make harmful contributions or not contribute at all. As a result, people and communities suffer. It is not an overstatement to assert that it is a matter of human life or death. This signals the deep need for people and businesses to invest in education to understand race and equity. It also signals the dire need for diversity and inclusion at all levels of staffing and decision making within companies. Companies need support to demystify race, disparity and equity and the role they play in emergency preparedness and response. Full integration of the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of business leadership, decision making, and operations are moral and economic imperatives. Teams of people with diverse backgrounds will bring diverse solutions to the table, which leads to more informed decision making processes and improved business results. Alfred D. Whitard expertly works with businesses to help them elevate and integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion principles and strategies and develop race-informed cultures. We are here to help. Contact us. Hi everyone, my name is Valerie Grant and I'm the Managing Director of Geotech Vision. And today, we're really living in unprecedented times. And we're embracing a situation that is by no means normal. We have been experiencing a forced digital transformation and COVID-19 has revealed several inequities in our society. The coronavirus continues to expose the digital divide and so I've become increasingly concerned about the fragilities in our educational system and the inequities that have been highlighted. I've therefore been thinking increasingly about the impact of geography on our educational destiny. Education is a human right. And equity creates equality by prioritizing resources to the students that need it most. So why aren't we using the tools that exist to identify those gaps and to find meaningful ways to get the resources to those students? Fantastic, thank you. Uh, now we're going to get ready for part two of this segment. Uh, Laura Busolo is going to be our next moderator. Are, is the video um, continuing? We have a, a dedication.
Well, I didn't know Autumn Jones, but now I really wish I had had a chance to meet her. Um, you can tell from the smile that she was a vibrant person and that her, her impact on many at Esri was felt and will continue to be felt. Um, I'm going to take a moment now to introduce the next moderator, Laura Busolo, who is my colleague in Esri, but in Redlands. Laura helps support customers with ArcGIS Enterprise Technology. She's also involved with employee resource groups such as North Star, Black Girls Map, yay, and amongst others. And she will take us through the next panel. Laura, thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. That, that was a very informative session. Um, so for this next part, uh, we're going to take through part two. My name is Laura Busolo, as you heard. I work to support customers with ArcGIS Enterprise Technologies here at Esri. And prior to that, I worked as a consultant with the Homeland Advisory Security Advisory Council to help configure web applications, including dashboards to monitor uh, things like the LA Marathon in 2018. At the time, I worked a lot with first responders to help them build information products that help them make informed decisions. Um, I also worked a little bit in business de development back in Kenya uh, with Technobrain Group uh, to help create proof proofs of concept, location al analytics, and in banking, uh, just creating a bunch of different uh, responses to proposals and POCs for um, some of these industries. Um, I do appreciate for uh, it was quite interesting to hear some of the more than day challenges and success stories in tackling equitable dis disaster response, uh, including the ec economic and racial impacts of the current pandemic that we're having, that is COVID-19. So for this second part of the conversation, we will have um, a discussion with some of the organizers and founders of the professional affinity employee resource groups and organizations that focus on GIS and people of African descent, including North Star, Here Technologies, and African women in GIS. Uh, we'll try to get an understanding of some of the motivating factors that led um, these individuals to take action to move the needle forward in terms of addressing matches that are related to racial and gender equity and also empowering activism. So we'll learn a little bit more about that. Uh, but to start off, I'd like to introduce um, some of our panels. And I'd just like for, for all, the, all of our panelists and attendees to remember to make sure we just uh, take care of the audio. If you have your audio on, just make sure you have it off if you need to have it off uh, so that we can minimize any background noise. Um, so I'll start off, we have Clinton Johnson, who is the solution architect at Esri uh, for Patterns and Practices and the founder of an employee resource group, resource group at Esri called Notstar. Um, we also have Chidima Umeogu, a lecturer at the Department of Geography and Metrology at Namdi Azikiwe University and a co-founder of African Women in GIS, as well as Luther Siebert the Vice President and Head of Quality Management at Here Technologies. So I'll just have the panelists introduce themselves and give us a little bit more about uh, when they started their organization and a little bit more about their background. Okay, I'll start. Um, again, I'm Clinton Johnson. And in addition to being a solution architect on our global uh, architecture team, I also lead a new initiative at, at Esri uh, called the Racial Equity Team. And a lot of that has a lot to do with some of the things that we've been doing around um, North Star. Uh, so we started North Star about uh, a year and a half, maybe two years, 
coming up to two years ago uh, pretty soon. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about like some of the some of the, the key moments that led to creating North Star. Um, but we we wanted to sort of step into some of the some of the, some traditions that we know uh, have existed in creating change in in um, in how Black people show up in different spaces. And in this case, uh, we had workforce equity in mind in, in GIS in general, not just Esri. Um, and so we we built something that was a bit bigger than than just being an ERG inside of Esri and just being an ERG in general. And we, wanted to make sure we had an impact on business overall. Okay, uh, we'll go next to Chirima. Hello. Our people remain in GIS was founded in 2017. And that was motivated really that in Africa and Nigeria, for example, we have few women in GIS. I always find myself as the only lady either in the classroom or in the workplace. So it's a kind of a lonely journey in the GIS industry. So um, the group was formed now to bring women of African descent who are in GIS together to form a community where each of us can support one another, get to know each other and communicate very well. So um, in 2017, I founded my own group for African Women in GIS and Joint Shakespeare. Then my co-founder, Sihana Williams, founded hers in 2019. So in 2019, March, April, we came together to form what we have now as African Women in GIS. And so far, our journey has been set. That's great. <laughs> Luther, give us a little bit about your background um, with HERE Technologies and what you do. Sure, and, and first, thank uh, you for this invitation. Um, I was really excited about this. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Luther uh, Siebert. I'm obviously um, um, part of um, HERE Technologies um, as uh, Vice President of Quality. So, uh, you know, HERE, Here Technologies, and unfortunately, this is, this is where the stars kind of lined up that um, Esri and HERE have had a 15-year partnership and we're continuing to build upon that um, strategy together uh, for future growth and solutions, right, around data and location and, and, and GIS. Um, here Technologies, um, I've been with the company for over 13 years and I'm fortunate to uh, work in multiple capacities um, in operations and managing portfolio. And from, from day one, this is a company that by virtue of what it does had a global presence uh, we build uh, over um, maps in over 200 countries as an example of a product. Uh, we have offices um, nearly 150 countries. Um, so understanding the importance of local and the importance of, um, you know, the, the perspectives of local, how to do business, how to innovate uh, has been at the, the heart of um, how we are, got to where we are today. Um, along the way, um, uh, there has been an evolution of the culture. And as we all know, culture does not change quickly and easily. Um, yeah. And so um, uh, hats off to our mean and lean um, IDB team led by John Betty um, for having planted the seeds um, that began to spawn um, ERGs. Um, and so uh, I am a co-sponsor, a co-executive sponsor. I have to give a shout out to Ray Lewis, who is a here director on global operations um, to have formed uh, and worked with uh, the team um, over a year. So we've officially launched here in um, February. Um, but um, I'll talk more about it, but my history in ERGs really go back to 91 when I actually formed one. As an executive sponsor, we've, we've supported um, the grassroots effort and it's all built around belonging because let's face it, um, um, diversity um, and inclusion are acts of enablement from others, but belonging, you have to feel you belong. Um, and so creating the environment, creating the culture um, doesn't happen overnight, but it is something that uh, was top of mind uh, for the organization. And that's why um, I've also stepped in with Ray and really supported the, this uh, ERG. 
That's great. Uh, Luther, I'll circle back to you and Clinton just to have an understanding of what gave you, what motivated you to get involved and get started with these ERGs. Uh, I did see a question um, with one of the attendees and I do see that it's been answered. Uh, for those that are not aware, uh, Autumn was part of Esri and she was really just a champion for some of the grassroots employee resource groups here. Uh, but we lost her a few months ago, um, but she was very fundamental and instrumental in just driving a lot of um, grassroots ERGs here at Esri. So um, with that, I'll kind of segue back into uh, a question. I'll go for, to you, Clinton, just to give us an understanding of what drove you to actually get involved in these ERGs. And then we'll come back to Luther with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely talk about that. And also, I want to um, remind myself at the end to, to really key in on how um, the impact that Autumn had on um, my thoughts around as I, you know, as as what became North Star was taking shape. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've worked in the the IT industry for 20 years um, or more. And but but for me, most of that time was spent in local government, in a local government in a big city that happened to be 40 to 45 percent black the entire time I've been here. Um, so I I was used to always seeing. Um, Black people in my day, uh, on my way to work, moving into the building, walking down the, the hall, um, and not just black people, but a variety of people of color. And when I started at Esri uh, in 2016, um, this, that was a, it was a completely different experience for me. Suddenly, I was 100% of the black staff in the office that I was in. And something about that just didn't seem, a lot about that just didn't seem right. Um, there, there's over 600,000 adult people of color in the Philadelphia area, and I, and I could not have been the only one um, who deserved to be there. From time to time, there'd be you know, one or two other people of color there. Um, and so some, I had to do something about that. It was also, again, 2016. And we were experiencing uh, another period in our history. Uh, I will not pretend as if these are brand new moments. But another period in our history where we were um, grossly aware of racial injustices against um, Black people, specifically almost, on an almost daily basis, seeing uh, videos and imagery of Black people being brutalized and killed, um, mostly at the hand of law enforcement. And it was really difficult to move into my work environment every day um, and not have you know, the resources that I, saw, that I had taken advantage of, taken, taken for granted. Uh, you know, other people who understood the issue, saw it the same way or similarly to the way I saw it, um, who I, I wouldn't have been able to, to get to my office, um, you know, once I entered the building without hearing conversation about it or even on my way to work. Um, and that had all changed. And I realized it wasn't just a challenge for me, it was a challenge for people scattered around, all around Esri. Um, and at the same time, while, while that was going on, I would find myself in interactions with customers who we're talking about um, their needs around equity and social justice. Not only were, um, you know, were we seeing injustice regularly, there were organizations all around trying to do something about it. And I worked with cities and counties for the first three and a half years that I was at Esri, and every single one of them, each one, asked us point blank for help addressing um, equity in some way. Uh, racial equity very specifically um, in most cases and all too often, the conversation didn't go very well. Um, and I thought that we could and should do something about that. And it occurred to me that a big part of why um, I saw it that way could have been my, the, the, the perspective that I, that I am given in life, you know, as a, as a Black American, um, you know, your racial identity has an impact on the way you see the world, the way you interact. And thus, I am positioned such that I can see that um, challenge and hear that challenge and engage in a conversation around that challenge. And as I was going around calling people to connect, um, to commiserate, um, and, and, to, and, to, and to come together when, you know, there would be another killing, we were also talking about business. It was a core part of our conversation. People at Esri want to change the world, 
and I ended up, and I discovered that many other black employees were having the same experience when customers were bringing up equity and social justice or racial equity specifically, you know, we felt like we weren't quite doing enough. So we decided to, to bake into our efforts to change GIS to be more representative of us, to be more inclusive, inclusive for us and to, and to be a place where we all felt like we belong. We wanted to do the social and career networking. We wanted to increase awareness of GIS career opportunities among students, but we also wanted to focus on business. So we focused on GIS for equity and social justice. And when I started to connect with Autumn around that stuff, she said, you know what, Clinton, that's powerful, but you have to do more than just try to change GIS. I need you and the other people who are um, creating communities at Esri to help me to change the culture at Esri, to be as inclusive as we want it to be. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Luther, uh, could you give us a little bit more about um, some of these challenges and how you feel like you were motivated to start these organizations? Yeah, no, no question. And, and you know, for me, it, it, you said it, it really was about being a part of change. Um, it's interesting, I, I don't want to go back to the beginning of time, but um, I was very fortunate with my father in the Air Force. Um, and and uh, I spent years abroad uh, until he retired when I was 12. Uh, uh, been in the U.S., different cities, lived, went to urban schools, uh, went to schools on military bases, had a lot of exposure, was able to see things through multiple lenses. Um, high school in Detroit, where my formative years were, was in a school of 4,000, um, which was 99.9% .9 black. Um, sitting across from young men and women who already were not afforded the opportunities I were. And because of that, um, I know many didn't make it. And I'm talking prison, I'm talking, didn't finish high school, the 425 of us that graduated together. So imagine the, the, the attrition rate and then reticulation uh, through college, very low. So what I saw very early, and it, you didn't connect it to, you got amongst peers in college, is the inequities because I was allowed to be at the college I was in apparently because they lowered standards in affirmative action, not because I was capable. So from that early seeds, um, I became very conscious and aware. And while I chose a technical path uh, because of my exposure and chose a path um, in corporations, uh, starting with uh, GM, then Ford, then Motorola, uh, before here technologies, it was in 91 that I actually was part of a founding a um, uh, small group that started a um, black affinity group, black African affinity group within Motorola Automotive and later became exec sponsor as I was there 16 years for um, the black affinity group um, of Motorola overall. Um, and, you know, obviously what, what motivated me, as I said, was change. And as we come into um, uh, where I am today, um, I actually started, um, I'm involved in every affinity group. Um, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, Here Vamos, uh, that's Here Pride, Here Vamos for Latinx, Latinx and um, Hispanic, um, and for WIN, uh, Women's Network. And the idea is there's um, certainly a, a, a unique agendas and needs and challenges, but there is intersect points, there's overlap. Um, there's an opportunity to bring in viewpoints um, that help and shape and change the culture uh, of the company that resonates with the strategy. Right, and because there is not a representation of leadership, it is hard to uh, make that change. It's just that much harder. So being a leader, I have, I'm very clear about which hats I wear. There are multiple. There's me, right, as a African-American male. There's me as a leader. There's me as an advisor, a mentor, a coach. And so wearing those hats uh, brings it back home for me because change is so fast I have a 20 and a 22 year old son who are on the lines protesting. I have a daughter who's 16 years old who sees inequities in her chosen profession of ballet, but who's doing extremely well in it. But bringing all that home, I realized the importance of um, really enabling um, equities and opportunities, right? To bring out the best in everything we do and the companies that we represent. Thank you. Uh, Chidim, I know we haven't heard from you, but I, with all this intersectionality, I'd really like to hear more about how African women in GIS has impacted GIS and GIS professionals at large. Okay, and thank you. 
like I said earlier, African Women in GIS is a community for women in Africa. The movement. Uh, did we lose you, Chidima? Um, started, um, I always find myself. It wasn't so interesting. We found Urban Together Women via our social hand, head of mouth, trying to convert more women to join the industry. So, so far, our women have been invited, our members have been invited from the community. We, all, we have held some webinars in the past where Dr. Dawn spoke to us in African Women Days. That was like much the rebels. Then, of now, we have some of our ladies volunteering with some companies. On hair technology, you have a webinar with this that the collaboration ongoing with the group too. So I'm um, so far, our women have been doing so wonderful. Most have been encouraged to stick to their career paths, because they found it difficult to stick to the career, uh, career paths. But they find it intimidating that being that GIS is an industry is a male-dominated environment. So they tend to shy away. And to some of them, you have given them voice to be courageous, to be firm in their decision, and to keep up being in the industry. So, so far, so good having, having this testimony. So then, some have gained scholarship from our group. Some have gained uh, mentors. We have an ongoing mentorship program right now. And lots of our ladies are benefiting from that. That's really incredible to hear like some of the impact you have had in terms of, you know, just giving access and information to these young women uh, to understand that, you know, they're not limited with some of the STEM programs that they can actually get involved in. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to hear um, some of the challenges that you face with starting off these uh, organizations. And I'd like to hear from each of you, like maybe one or two points, uh, starting with you, Chidema, now that we still have you on um, the line. Um, Chidema, can you hear? Are you there? Maybe we can uh, go over to Clinton as we wait for Chidema and then we can circle back to Luther. Oh, are you back, Chidema? I'll, I'll get started. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, there are a number of things, and I'll just take a couple of them. Um, one, to be clear, um, we're, we were trying to create an organization uh, that was about increasing, um, changing the face of GIS, right? So, so making it more inclusive, and, and so it would look like us. And, and what it means to be us or to look like us is, is not this monolithic thing, and it absolutely is not um, what it what it is thought of let's say in the united states right so just like what to call people how to refer to people who um who when they come to the u.s gets ra get racialized as black right so how to make sure that we're being inclusive in the way that we name so we we refer to people of african descent and we also say black people um and then how to make sure we are um being inclusive in the way that we engage community and um, and lift folks up. So to help us do that, we started with, we started with where our elders um, and others um, left off or where they left us. And so we looked at um, principles from the Black Panther Party. We looked at principles from um, the Black Lives Matter organization. And I would challenge anyone to find a a set of principles that are that are more about inclusion than than what we had there, um, and we started with um, principles of Kwanzaa, um, which were really about like um, taking this disparate um, collection of us in the diaspora who are scattered around the world because of slavery, colonialism, and other things, and and making us one. And so there was a lot in in those in those principles that guided us to. To just try to be more inclusive and we continue to struggle to, to make sure that we are um, reflective of the full diversity of what it means to be black or to be a person of african descent yeah thank you uh luther yeah so definitely agree um 
um, you know, Clinton with the challenges you highlighted. Let me take it maybe a, a little differently. I mean, Don um, uh, said it in a, in a prior uh, session um, uh, that change takes time. There's, there's absolutely no question. And then Adrian um, also made it very clear, you know, and I feel that strongly as a, as a leader that we have a responsibility. Now, I don't sit on the board and I'm not the CEO. Um, so I think the, the bigger challenge I, I'd highlight is how we get the critical mass and connection, the strategies that aren't just the ERG, right? I've already highlighted IDB having planted the seeds. Um, IDB um, creating the framework and even a playbook for allyship and what it means. Um, but the key words for an ERG is a resource. So how do we become a resource for leadership? How do we create the channels that uh, helps them understand, because as we know with understanding, um, then comes um, a, a different view of empathy, a different lens, and therefore um, change can be contemplated and considered. So from, from my perspective is finding that balance of the need to change now with the need to allow and manage change. Uh, change management is not just nice words. There are principles behind it. And so how we have an integrated strategy that is part ERG driven, which is clearly aligned with the things that we find important that we need to bring in to work, right? And how we align that to the professional side of why we were here, because the why we are here as a company and what we are trying to do together is very important, especially to this most recent generation, right? The why. And then how we do it and make the connections to leadership uh, and find the allies. And I mean allies that are in the newest definition of taking action on our behalf, right? Because it is now how we drive that. And even formulating and creating that is not something that you drop on a piece of paper and you're all done. You got to manage the change to change. And so from my perspective, that's uh, I think the, 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 the thing that really gives me energy and I think a lot of us are thinking about and collaborating on across the organization, not in silos, but how do we make this change together? Yeah, and I think that's important just to make sure that there's that intersectionality and working together to actually make sure that uh, we are driving this change together. So in the interest of time, I think I'll just make sure that I'll inform the attendees um, to take a look or just be on the lookout for the pop-up for the poll. And also feel free to enter your questions. Uh, we'll try our best to take some of those questions there. Um, and then with that, I'll, I'd like to hear a little bit from, um, from Luther and Clinton. And if Chidima, you have any input on this as well, I'd like to hear like any sort of advice you'd like to give to any individual who would uh, like to start up any of these organizations within their organization to kind of help them. If you could give us like a point, one, one fundamental thing that you've learned that you feel would be useful to them. I mean, we can toggle and I'll, I'll go and then. Um, yeah. Luther. Um, so I think the one maybe not as obvious thing that I'll, I'll talk about because there's many things is that towards the, towards the idea of allyship, um, it isn't enough to just work internally. It isn't enough to just look to the community, the constituents that you're looking to, um, to help. Um, in our case, you know, black people, people, people of African descent um, and GIS, it isn't enough to just look to them. It isn't enough just to look internally to uh, stakeholders who you want to partner with to create, you know, organizational change in, inside of, in the context of ERG and at an organization, you have to also go outside. You need to have an, because to, to Luther's point, um, as an employee of an organization, and from North Star's perspective, as a participant in an industry, in a field, um, as a GISer, if you will, as a person in, in the geosciences and related fields, we're here for a purpose. Um, which is a big part of why we chose to, to, to focus on GIS for equity and social justice, to create a seat, create a table for ourselves, build seats, put ourselves in them, you know, provide thought leadership. Um, but doing all that meant having help outside of our organization, having, self, having help outside of the con of context of what it means to be Black, but also having help outside of the confines of, of ESRI to understand the needs and challenges of the industry, 
and to get the best advice and mentorship from, from those who have succeeded and continue to struggle to succeed in a variety of industries and areas and disciplines. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great answer, Clinton, because uh, you're, you're walking um, the, the talk based on this program and, and working with here, Unity and Power and others. Um, that's critical, right? And we benefit greatly from it. Um, I think my advice to um, um, someone um, looking to form and start is, um, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of, lot, of, lot of basic things you have to do and get right. Um, but I, but I think the thing I'd advise is make sure you figure out how to be inclusive in your inclusivity. Okay, and what I mean by that is having experienced uh, multiple phases over time in history of uh, ERG formations and successes and, and wins and, and losses, um, the, the black experience, the African experience is not monolithic. And so, you know, uh, making sure we have the right um, um, way of including and defining um, what represents us um, and, and to be, um, create the, the dialogue that brings understanding amongst ourselves as to what we represent and how we come in. Because there's, I've seen it where, okay, um, we got this thing coming together, black people, um, do I jump in or am I taking, as a black person, do I jump in or do I take a, a risk or let me just wait and see. And I think getting critical mass is a part of that. And um, that's not to say that uh, it doesn't happen. Um, it does, but I would say that having um, round tables, having dialogue, uh, bringing on uh, those who represent the diaspora of that ERG's experience um, set um, brings people together right up front so you're not depending on two people catalyzing. Because this is a grassroots effort. This is not me as an advisor saying we got to form it. This is, I'm supporting. This is how does it come about at a grassroots and how does it become uh, fairly inclusive and build momentum? Because there's nothing like losing momentum along the way. And yeah. I think that's the way you do that. And that would be my advice. Thank you. Uh, Chirima, I know Clinton, uh, you already got a mention of some of the things you're involved in, including GIS for equity and social justice. Uh, but I'd like to hear from Chirima a little bit about um, something you feel like you learned about yourself or you can share uh, with others who are open or would like to actually uh, start up these ERGs? Chidima? Sorry, my, I was on it. So far my, my journey has been so good. I've been challenging to, I'm one, I'm like, I like being in the background. Like I like being walking back behind the stage. But so far this, journey has brought me the forefront. Never have I imagined I'm going to be a lecturer, teaching students, GIS. But here I am, my passion led me here. It wasn't easy, but the passion, the purpose, and focus led me to where I am today. So the most important thing is uh, I've learned to be myself. I've learned how to to, over, to overcome the obstacles, the oppositions that came along in this journey. But when we started the, um, the, the community, we had a lot of opposition from men. Like, why we you start a, a woman only group? Whereas you have a general group for everybody. I keep telling them that some women can't talk in the midst of men. As of being maybe that timidity or they're being, they're scared. But so far, because um, so far so good, our uh, women, you can, you can see them get the social media handle, body writing, GIS analytics, before they do hide away from the spotlight. So we've been grooming them so far, and myself too, and we've been grooming ourselves together to be in the spotlight and be proud of our journey and proud of our career path. Even though we 
we are a few women in the industry, we have to you know, show ourselves and know that we're on the right career path. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that's very inspiring just to make sure that the ladies or the young women uh, know that these opportunities are there for them and just to encourage them to be part of it. Uh, right now, I'd like to encourage the audience, if they haven't already, if you have any questions that you'd like to pose right now, uh, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A button. Um, then we can see if we can take maybe one or two. Um, are there any as we wait for that, are there any like long-term plan plans for your group and um, how do you actually envision these plans panning along? If we can get maybe 30 seconds each <laughs> for you to kind of give us like a quick fire answer for that. Yeah, I think um, I want to make sure that, that North Star is continuing to impact GIS broadly, um, not just Esri. Um, and, and we, as we look to grow more in the area of, of focusing on raising awareness of career opportunities in GIS, I just want you all to, to, um, to be on the lookout for a significant announcement from us uh, next week at the actual homecoming event. Um, I'll hand off from there. Okay, Luther? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, it, it fits right within the pillars of um, uh, increasing representation um, across all, all um, levels within the organization, um, making connections internal and external, which are clearly, um, Clinton, you've, you've highlighted and, uh, and are leading and having this community impact. STEM in particular, uh, things like Black uh, Girls Code um, uh, and other programs. Um, but it's all around the epicenter of how not just GIS, but those supporting functions all create opportunities and how at the heart of this, you know, that's why this is so great for two companies, Esri and, um, and here Technologies and others that you represent. Um, but we aren't B2C, we're B2B. Uh, a lot of consumer-based companies are evolving and changing for obvious reasons. I'm not saying that's wrong, um, but this is about truth and data and change. And that's at the heart of GIS. And so making an impact um, amongst ourselves um, and as a company and externally uh, in the community and building more early, very early, getting children when they are young because it starts extremely early um, that they see um, or they experience uh, disadvantages that take them away from the opportunities. Okay, thank you. I know we're kind of spent for time. I see a bunch of questions here. I'll just pick maybe one or two um, so we have one question here that asks, how important is an organization corporate support to the success of an ERG? Uh, Clinton, if you can answer that maybe in 30 seconds, um, we can handle the rest of the questions. Sure. Um, I guess my answer is I'm not entirely sure um, because our, our efforts at Esri are largely grassroots. And while there are over 60 employee communities now and um, maybe about five or six that see themselves as employee resource groups, we've largely moved forward with, um, I mean, Esri Corporate's not getting in the way, um, but we don't have any, we don't have any funded ERGs or, or um, corporately sponsored ERGs and, and what employee resource groups in the, in the, um, in the sense that uh, a lot of organizations do. And I think Luther will be able to speak to that a little bit more. Um, specifically, you know, what that tends to look like in other, in other companies. Okay. Um, I do see here uh, our timekeeper is telling us we're a little bit out of time, even though I love the fact that we had a great discussion today. Um, I do want to take this time to make sure that I inform all the attendees that we thank you for attending. Um, we'll go ahead and have some of those questions. We'll try to reach you um, in some way or fashion to answer those questions, but we do appreciate the time for all the panelists um, that have taken their time to have these conversations because I think it's important for us to all uh, work together to actually make these impacts within the organization and the communities at la large. Yeah, too. I want to thank everybody for participating today, especially the, um, the panelists uh, and also our sponsors at um, Spatial GIS, Here Technologies, Voice Media Ventures, Critigen, Geotech Vision, and New Light Technologies. 
Um, we really appreciate the investment that you made in us, and, and we hope that we can all continue to collaborate to, to continue to change the culture of, of, um, of GIS in the way that um, Autumn Jones always encouraged us to do so. Yeah, and please take time to uh, take the survey. It's in the screen being shared right now. You can either use the QR code to access it or the actual survey link to fill out the survey. All right, with that, I think it's been put in the chat window, so feel free to click on that link to answer a few questions for us. But I hope everyone has a lovely Sunday from wherever you are. Good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> good morning, maybe, uh, depending on the time zone, but have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Okay.